everyone hear me okay? Uh, I'd also like to welcome all our uh, Lake Up sites across long distance. Uh, welcome to this evening's presentation in the continuing uh, psychology series for the community. Uh, my name is uh, Jacqueline Goodwin. I'm a psychology intern here at IWK on the eating disorders team. And I have the distinct pleasure this evening of telling you a little bit about uh, Dr. Joey Gazella. Uh, Dr. Gazella was born in Ottawa and obtained a master's degree at Carleton University. And she eventually graduated with a PhD in clinical psychology from Queen's University in 1986. She eventually joined the IWK Centre where she has been involved in all levels of care of children and adolescents diagnosed with eating disorders since 1991. In her work here at IWK, she's been an integral leader in the development of inpatient and outpatient treatment services, as well as the, as the development of innovative assessment tools for help, helping youth begin their job of challenging the eating disorder. In addition to her clinical work, she is a very active researcher She's been involved in the Department of Health and Nova Scotia Treatment Network, as well as a number of provincially and federally funded research uh, projects, including a recent one uh, aimed at developing and evaluating a web-based training program for educators in the province of Nova Scotia uh, who wish to promote healthy body images and lifestyles in youth. In addition, Dr. Gazella has been a lecturer and teacher at various workshops in Eastern Canada and she is currently a lecturer for the Department of Pediatrics and Psychiatry at Dalhousie, and as well as a clinical associate for the clinical psychology programs at Dal and Acadia. In addition to all of that, she runs a private practice here in the Halifax area, and has also managed to find time to, to raise two busy boys in the middle of all that. Um, on a personal note, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with Joanne for the last six months. I've seen up close and personal her tremendous clinical skills, as well as her true passion in working with this population of children and their families. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Joanne Gazella. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jackie, for the introduction. Um, I'm really quite excited to be able to be here tonight and to talk to parents and other members in the community about eating disorders and my experience with them. I was just reflecting before I uh, started tonight to, um, to think about how long I've been in this job and what changes have happened over that time. And I really realized that I've been the leader of the eating disorder clinic for the last 15 years. So it's been a long time, time passes quickly. And so what I'd like to be able to share with you tonight, not only are some of the um, you know, best practices in, in treating, with ch treating children and adolescents, but also to have you recognize that this area is still very new. In fact, it's been in the last 15 years that the, the, the methods that we use now in, in eating disorder treatment with children and adolescents have been developed. So when I started out 15 years ago, we just didn't have the base of knowledge that we do now. And we're still in our infancy. So in, in the sense that we need a lot more research in this area to fine tune uh, the best way to treat children and adolescents. So what I'd like to do as I go along, I, I understand it's best to sort of wait until the end to ask the questions um, because it is being videotaped. And so we will do that. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I know that the title of this talk is really to contrast a little bit uh, what we do with children as compared to adults. And so what I'm going to do is with each slide, I will comment on whether or not there are any differences between the treatment of children and adults um, as I go along. First of all, there's a definition that we use for anorexia nervosa, and this is one of the main eating disorders that we treat. Anorexia nervosa um, is all about refusal to maintain body weight. And what we mean by that is uh, a, a young person or an adult um, desiring to keep their weight less than 85% of their ideal body weight. And so how that's determined is that through a, a GP and nutrition 
consult, uh, what's determined is what that person's ideal body weight is, is supposed to be for health. And then uh, it's sort of determined what weight they're at currently. And if the person is less than 85% of their ideal body weight, then that certainly signals that we may have anorexia going on here. But the other things that are important are that the individual has an intense fear of weight gain. And um, for any of you who have any experience working with or seeing uh, an individual who has anorexia nervosa, they are very concerned, like to a, uh, they're terrified of, of gaining weight. And so before anything goes in their mouth, they're inspecting it and thinking about how many calories or fat grams are going to go into their mouth. Um, and they may decide not to take a bite as a result of this. Um, body image disturbance, that's all about the individual. Not only, you know, this, this isn't just about um, someone saying that they don't like their body appearance because most of us have difficulties with the way we look or we have some part of our body that we don't like as well as, as you know, the other parts and so on. So I mean, when it comes to dissatisfaction, that's a pretty common thing to be dissatisfied with your body in some way. When it comes to body image disturbance, it's more that the individual doesn't even see themselves the way they are. So with anorexia, a person could be very thin and see themselves as very overweight. And so when parents or sisters or brothers or friends hear, um, you know, their, their good friend say something like, you know, I feel really fat and, and really what they look is skeletal or very thin, that's a, a very scary statement to make. Um, so individuals with anorexia nervosa have this kind of body image disturbance. Amenorrhea happens in females, and what that's all about is that the menses, their menstrual periods, cease. And uh, the reason that they cease is because of the fact that they do not have enough body fat to support their menstrual period. Um, basically, the, the body and brain make a decision about whether or not it makes sense to uh, continue having uh, a regular cycle. And if there's not enough energy in the body for, you know, for all of the other functions that need to happen, menstrual periods uh, are the first thing to go. And that may not seem too upsetting for a lot of girls who are quite happy not to have a menstrual period. But the fact is, without a menstrual period, the bones are affected because both depend on the production of estrogen in the body, in the brain. And if estrogen is not produced, um, if there's no menstrual period, you also know that the estrogen is not being produced normally. So the estrogen is needed for calcium to be deposited in the bones. So we get pretty concerned about individuals who, uh, who don't have their menstrual periods for a long period of time. And so anorexia, in this sense, children and adolescents um, and adults could fit all of this type of description of anorexia nervosa. Where children differ is that you see a lot more um, variability in what anorexia is. So we might see a boy or a girl who comes in and they're refusing to eat because they're terrified about food and gaining weight. Um, but you know, perhaps the issues are more around that they don't want to grow up or they're having some difficulty with some kind of responsibility and it's not so much uh, about their body image per se, but it's more about, um, it could be about issues of uh, growing taller and, and have nothing to do per se with weight. They might be afraid of growing taller or growing up on uh, taking on responsibilities and so on. So there's a lot more sort of fear-related issues with younger children. Um, and that's typically not seen with adults. You, you also get some children who emotionally, um, and I'm going to tell you that there's a high incidence of people with eating disorders also having depression it's a 60% chance that the two of them are going to co-occur. And so when we see children 
sometimes there's a depression that has preceded them not wanting to eat. And uh, it's interesting the way that works is that in the brain, one of the neurochemicals that we know the most about is serotonin. And when we see changes in serotonin, like it being unavailable in the brain or, or less available, you see individuals becoming more depressed, becoming more obsessive, and eating disorders can follow both of those um, problems as well. So what I'm telling you is that children are very vulnerable when it comes to these changes in their bodies and their brains. And so you can have two subtypes of anorexia. One is restricting only, and that is when the individual, that means that they're, they're just focused on not eating uh, enough food to maintain their weight. The other subtype is binging and purging. So there are some individuals with eating disorders, with, with anorexia, sorry, who also at times eat too much food all at once. Uh, and often will eat it too quickly and then afterwards will try to get rid of it by vomiting or by exercising uh, right after eating and exercising to the extent that they've made sure that they've gotten rid of every calorie that they took in. So those things can co-occur and uh, when anorexia also involves uh, the purging that makes it even more serious that there are some Certainly with purging, you get changes in your electrolyte balance in your body, and that's the balance of salt and water. Uh, and the salt water is very important that it be in the correct balance because your heart is like a battery, and it operates on the basis of those two things being in balance. Okay, so that's anorexia. The other one we're talking about tonight is bulimia nervosa. And in this one, you get recurrent episodes of binge eating. So just as I said, binge eating is all about eating in a short period of time, a large amount of food. So we're not talking about, you know, we tend to use that word rather loosely in our society. We might say, no, I went home and binged on whatever, chips or pizza or whatever. And what that means is that we ate a lot more than we normally would. But that's not what a binge is. Um, a binge is eating a, a great deal of food, usually. And it's doing it in a fashion where a person feels out of control. They don't feel like they could stop if they wanted to. And um, generally speaking, they do stop only when they feel pain in their stomach. So they've eaten that much that they feel a, a fair bit of pain. And so the next thing that they do is they try to get rid of the food. And it, they could try to get rid of it by purging, which is kind of self-inducing vomiting, causing themselves to vomit. Um, they might also take laxatives, which they falsely believe is going to take away the weight. It doesn't. It just affects water balance in your body. Um, so, or they might do as well, uh, they might do the over-exercising and just drive themselves kind of, you know, on a treadmill or, or, or a bicycle or go running or do something that they feel is kind of like getting rid of the food calories. Um, so the recurrent weight control behavior to prevent weight gain are all of these things. They might be vomiting, using laxatives, excessive exercise, or fasting. And how the fasting works is that the individual might say, well, I binged last night, so now I vow to fast the next day. And so I'm not going to eat anything. I'm just going to drink water, or, or I'm going to eat very little. And the problem with that is that it becomes a real cycle. So you can imagine that if the person starves themselves the next day, they just precipitate this cycle where then, you know, at the end of the day, they're feeling very you know, deprived and hungry and emotionally drained and so on. And so now the food goes in as a binge. So it, it's like eating becomes extremely chaotic. And they too can lose their menstrual periods. Females can lose their menstrual periods as a result of just the binge purging cycle, even without the weight loss, because it's just so chaotic for the body. Um, all right, so as I say, there, there are two subtypes. Some of them purge the vomiting, and some of them don't purge. And those are the ones who are using the other things like exercise and fasting. So first of all, if you're 
if you detect a problem and you happen to be the parent uh, of a, a child or an adolescent with an eating disorder, it's best to express your concerns noting specific behaviors to them. So you might sit your son or daughter down and, and say to them what you're concerned about. Um, so, you know, I heard you vomiting and I'm concerned about that. Um, or I see that you're, you know, you're not eating uh, when the family sits down to eat. So you're trying to find something specific uh, to, to talk with them about, because this is going to be a very difficult discussion that you're going to have. Young people, even adults, uh, do not like to admit that they have a problem with an eating disorder, um, and they may not realize they have a problem. So generally speaking, somebody with anorexia uh, may not know that this is really a problem for them. They might think that everybody else is jealous of them and that they're losing weight and or they might feel that, hey, if they're finally doing something good for themselves, so why are you, you know, calling them on it? Someone with binging and purging, someone with bulimia, is more likely to know themselves that, that there's something wrong about this because people don't generally eat that much food and they don't generally throw up food after eating. So they're more likely to know themselves that something's wrong, but the shame and so on what might cause them as well to deny it to you. Um, and because it is for an individual who's doing this, there's often a fair bit of shame that causes them to not come out with the behavior. So they can be going on for a long time with this one. It's very secretive. And they can go on for a long time without anyone knowing that they're doing this. So don't expect your son or daughter to be happy with your observation uh, about the fact that they've been vomiting or whatever. They may be upset with you. They may yell at you. They may tell you to mind your own business. They may ask you why you're being so mean. All sorts of things. And it's just realizing that those are behaviors that help them defend themselves um, when they feel that there might be a threat to what's going on with, with their behavior because it's very hard to change an eating disorder. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. So for a person to be ready to admit it, they also have to be ready to recognize that this is going to take, this is going to take some time and they're going to have to work at it really hard to deal with it. Let your child or adolescent know that a visit to the family doctor will help to check their general health and to get help if needed. So, you know, it's really, it's really important if you do have a child with a problem of anorexia or bulimia that you do get help because waiting around until they're you know saying to you I have a problem may be too late you know they may have may get more entrenched in that period of time so if you see that there's a problem it's good to talk with them about it and to you know if there isn't a problem fine but let the GP sort of you know examine them and see what's going on and and indicate whether or not there's anything to be concerned about. So if you are going to get help in Metro Halifax, you can access our mental health program and you can call this number. Now that's on your handout, in, in, within your handout, so you don't need to copy it down. Um, but that's how you would get help. And you would let the person on the other end know at Central Referral that you believe this is an eating disorder. Or perhaps you've already gone to your family doctor and your family doctor has said this is an eating disorder and we will send over the referral as well. And um, so that way at Central they know what they're dealing with right away and they will kind of put you in a, in a sort of a stack that is, is ready for the eating disorder team to look over. In other areas of Nova Scotia, uh, you can call your local mental health clinic. And tonight in your local sites, you may have somebody representing the local mental health clinic who can, uh, who can help you with accessing that type of um, referral. Um, yeah. So at the IWK, we have children, we have services here for children and adolescents up to the age of 19. Um, I am the team leader for the outpatient services, and uh, right now that outpatient services for the next three years is, is in a different spot than the hospital. 
We're actually at a place called Charter House, which is on, off of Spring Garden Road on, on Brenton Street. Um, what we offer there is uh, we do have a, a small team, but nevertheless, we're all represented. We have a, a dietitian, uh, we have a social worker, psychologist, a nurse who works with us part of the time, and we also work uh, with uh, uh, pediatricians in the community. And we uh, we all uh, sorry psychiatry. We have Stephanie Casey, Dr. Stephanie Casey, psychiatrist. We also usually have an intern or resident working with us. And this past while, uh, we've had Jackie Goodwin, who introduced me, working with with us. Um, so that's primarily our team, but we also work with the inpatient team in terms of a, as a consultant to their team. Um, and so the inpatient service, when children and adolescents come into hospital because their weight is too low, uh, or they're in a real binge purge pattern that can't be broken as an outpatient, uh, they may come on to the medical service, or they may come on to the general psychiatry ward. If they come on to the medical service, it's because their vitals have been found to be poor in some respect. So they have to go on to a medical ward to be stabilized before they're ready um, to, to go the next step. And often the next step is to go to the uh, general psychiatric ward. And what they do there is that they work on weight being reestablished. So just to say on the outpatient services, um, as I said, family group and limited individual type of work is, is done. And the reason that we focus a lot on family work is that is where uh, best practices lie for children and young adolescents. Um, we have learned in the past, within about the past 15 years, um, through research done by the Maudsley within the Maudsley Hospital in London, England, um, that um, there is a type of family therapy called the Maudsley Family Therapy that is quite effective with young people. And so we do more family work now using that approach. Tell you more about that as we go along. Okay, so now about adults in uh, in Metro Halifax. Um, there's the QE2 Adult Eating Disorder Clinic, and so for anyone 19 or up, that's certainly the the place to go uh, for for treatment of an eating disorder. Also, occasionally we might have might have a 17 or 18 year old that prefers to be treated at the adult site. Uh, reasons might be might be that they're out of high school and they're into university and now they want more of an adult approach. So that happens occasionally, and so there is a bit of an overlap there. Um, there are no specific inpatient beds. Uh, however, I mean they do they do have inpatient beds for eating dis for individuals with eating disorders at the QE2. They used to have more of a program um, there. And uh, that was lost over the years. Um, but what they do have now is they still use uh, a, a protocol there to help weight re reestablish weight. And uh, there are beds available when there when there is somebody who, who needs one. Um, I believe they end up with a waiting list though for their for those beds as well. And it still is a um, general kind of psychiatric ward. There's also a day program for outpatients, and it's group-based. Um, and uh, what that means is that uh, adults come in daily, and there are a series of different groups that they run uh, that these people attend. And uh, if I believe if they're working or in school, they try to work around those hours as well so that the individuals can take part in their program. They're always busy, they're always quite full, and there's always a waiting list. So um, that's quite a popular program. It is group-based, and they don't have any individual-based um, programs at the QE2 for eating disorders. They're now, I, I believe, going to start looking at some motivational groups as well. 
All right, so getting back to children and adolescents, statistics. Generally speaking, uh, studies have shown that the incidence of uh, anorexia nervosa is about 1%. And this is up to about the age of 17, 18 that these statistics are. But if you look at the adult population, you see about the same. You see a 1%. Um, bulimia nervosa is usually 1% to 2%. Some people cite it higher than that. And um, what they're looking at is a little bit more um, leeway in what they're describing as bulimia. Binge eating disorder, that's when a person does this binge eating, but they don't follow it with vomiting, um, or they, they're not trying to get rid of the food afterwards. So you can, it does lead to overweight and often obesity as well in an individual. And disordered eating is, is a very broad term, uh, and it encompasses um, individuals who might you know do this yo-yo dieting where they're not eating healthy, um, and they're kind of in and out of diets, or they're you know fasting one day and then overeating the next, or um, maybe they're eating all day long and just not stopping, but it can't be described as a binge because that's different from what a binge is like. So a variety of things could be disordered eating, and that encompasses a lot more people. Okay, so why would somebody develop an eating disorder? One of the things that the new Maudsley approach uh, really makes very clear um, is that we do not know why. We do not know the cause of any child or adolescent's eating disorder. We can speculate, you know, you as, as parents might speculate what you think is involved, but in fact we have no definitive test to say this is what caused their anorexia or their, their bulimia. What we do know is we do know factors that are associated with higher risk. So for example, we do know that individuals who are in gymnastics or dancing or who are on the stage appearing in front of an audience have a higher risk of developing an eating disorder. And that's primarily has to do with the fact that they're um, they're on stage, you know, in the sense that they are in an appearance-based kind of sport or profession. So we do know that those things increase the risk. We also know that individuals who have obsessive traits or who, or who are prone to depressed depression and so on, that they're more vulnerable to develop an eating disorder just by virtue of the fact that um, they may have kind of a lowered, lowered serotonin in their brains, and that kind of makes it more likely that they'd be vulnerable to these kinds of things. We also know that stress uh, makes a difference in people's lives, so if things happen that are stressful, they too can contribute to maybe bringing out the vulnerability in, in the individual. Um, and socially, you know, there may be things going on, there may be teasing, uh, is certainly something that's often associated with, you know, feeling feeling vulnerable because maybe they're in a situation where there's teasing going on, um, especially when there's teasing going on from individuals that they highly respect. Uh, so, for example, uh, a coach might be a, a, a very valued individual in that person's life, and so if a coach makes a statement about maybe you could be thinner, that's a huge, has a lot of value uh, to a young person. So, you know, thinking about those things, they certainly can have an impact. Um, but what combination, what events in a person's life, we can't say that. It's different from, for example, you know, if somebody develops skin cancer on their nose and, and we knew that they'd been out in the sun and so on, and we could fairly definitively say that exposure to the sun uh, along with maybe maybe they also had very uh, um, pale skin sort of thing. So we, we, could, we could tell you in those cases what caused uh, the skin cancer, but that's not the way it's, it is with an eating disorder. We can't tell any one person what caused it. And this is important to know because often parents blame themselves. You know, when something like this happens, um, parents sometimes turn inward and start thinking, what did I do wrong? 
And in fact, one of the things we try to do right away is to help parents to recognize that, you know what, these things happen in young people. And uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons that, that may be going on that are, you know, for this young person. But it's really not helpful to, to spend your time blaming yourself because it takes a lot of energy away from you. And, um, and you know, you, you may not be at all a part of this. So it it's really takes a lot of energy away from what you're going to need to do next, which is to be a big part of the treatment. And what we found um, through this Maudsley approach is that parents are their child or adolescent's best bet of recovery. Um, so that, in fact, we really want to help empower and mobilize parents um, rather than have them, you know, sort of uh, become paralyzed with immobility and feeling through feelings of blame or guilt. So lots of different reasons that go on here. Okay. So, you know, another thing other people often ask is, well, why do we call this an eating disorder? What does it have to do with eating? Um, and, and it can be helpful. And when, when I used to give talks to young people in schools, I would do this kind of exercise with them where I'd say to them, okay, I just want to talk to you about why we eat and why we stop eating. And they would generate a number of reasons why we eat or why we stop eating. And so they name physical reasons like being hungry or being full um, or, you know, needing food for growth, all those kind of physical reasons. And they'd name social, cultural reasons like it was my birthday or so we had cake or we were celebrating a wedding or those are, or, you know, Christmas or Hanukkah, whatever, whatever they did, that, that would be something that they would uh, say, you know, might be a, a reason why they were eating or not eating. Uh, emotional reasons were things like, you know, kids would say things like, well, sometimes at night when I want to stay up and I'm tired, I eat to stay awake. Yeah. And sometimes when I'm feeling down, I might eat to cheer up, comfort foods. Uh, sometimes when I'm happy, I just want to celebrate, you know, things like that. But the emotional reasons tended to be ones that were uh, related to negative emotions. Emotions where the person might eat, not because they're hungry, but because they're emotionally kind of needy or hungry. So we all do this. So the next thing I'd say to them is we all eat for all of those reasons. And, and that's, that's pretty normal to do that, to eat at times for all of those reasons. But what happens is that if a person's eating more, and I'll give you my next tip, if hunger and fullness are more emotional than physical, an eating disorder can develop. So as soon as people start looking at food, whether it be eating or fullness, right, feeling hungry or full, if they begin to satisfy their emotional needs with food, then it can become a disorder for them. And you can see even, you know, so the, the binge eating becoming a problem because somebody is taking in that food to maybe deal with their daily stress or their emotions, not because they're hungry. You know, maybe the first few bites are about hunger, but then the rest of it is more about emotional. And, uh, and the other thing is that uh, being full uh, oftentimes, young people who have anorexia will say to me, I can't eat that, I'm full. But they've gotten full after eating three grapes or something, you know, so it doesn't make any sense. But it makes sense from an emotional point of view because emotions are heavy. Negative emotions are heavy. If you feel depressed, you feel heavier. If anybody's ever, you feel tired, you feel heavier. So people who have emotional issues um, often will feel weighty. And one of the things I try to help young people understand is that concept of feeling full emotionally, but really their bodies are quite hungry. Okay, so most often with uh, children and with adults, this, this is not something uh, that's different between them. Most often it starts with a diet to lose weight. Um, so in most cases, binge eating, 
binge eating also starts with, with you know, not eating enough. So sometimes we don't think that because we might see somebody with bulimia and they might be average weight or overweight. That doesn't mean they haven't been dieting. In fact, they're more likely to have been dieting than the average population. So just because somebody's of average weight or overweight, you can't assume that they're not eating very chaotically and, and sort of starving themselves at, at times. So how this starts is with skipping meals, cutting out food groups, not listening to hunger cues, and over-exercising. And what that does is that when you start doing that kind of thing, and this would be even if the average individual were to start doing something like this, they would find themselves having decreased ability to concentrate. So at school, it would be harder to focus in. They'd have lower mood. And, and what that's about as well is the way that we get serotonin to our brains is through what we eat. Because what we eat becomes sort of the rudimentary um, of, of what is made uh, into serotonin. It's called tryptophan. But basically, you need to have food in order to get those um, the, the rudiments of developing the serotonin. So my point is, is that if you're not eating, you're going to have less of it in your brain. And, uh, and that's going to also lead to more obsessive behavior because those things are related as well. So no surprise when you become more obsessive. Let's say you've been on a diet to lose weight and now you've become more obsessive you could slide into deciding, hmm, I think I could lose some more weight now. As you lose more weight, you could become more obsessive. So it's not something that goes away, and, and young people who have dieted in this way will often say, I didn't know where to stop. Once it kind of slipped into it, I kind of slid into it, and once I got into that real driven obsessiveness, I, I couldn't stop it. it. It had a momentum of its own, like a snowball going down a hill. Um, so we think that people who are, who are vulnerable to this, not everybody who diets will become anorexic. We know that because it's only 1%. But those people who do diet and have a vulnerability to be obsessive, driven individuals, um, or, and or have depressed mood, low self-esteem, those are vulnerabilities. So, preoccupation with food and cooking, that's another sort of a, sometimes people, parents will say, this is so strange, my son or daughter has become really interested in cooking for the whole family. And this is part of, you know, what happens when your body is starving. You know, you think about it, when your body's starving, your brain is trying to tell you what to do, go for the food. So what the individual does is they, they bake, they cook, they're not eating it, but the fact that they're close to food is, uh, it kind of feels a bit better, like somehow they're getting something that their brain is telling them to, to move towards. And they also feel kind of good that they're making it for the rest of the family and, and they're not eating it themselves. Oh, they might also have rituals around eating, so you see them and they might look like they're eating like a bird or something, just picking small pieces off of bread. Or This is all part of sort of a ritual of, of thinking, maybe I'm getting less calories if I'm doing it this way, or maybe I can kind of pretend I'm eating but not really be eating. Move the food around on the plate, that kind of thing. Um, more tired, low energy, these are all effects of starvation. As well. In terms of uh, the effect on the body, as I said, the loss of menstrual periods, cold hands and feet can result because the body is, in order to have your circulation system working well, um, you have to have enough energy to fuel it. And so what happens is, and I will tell young people, um, that if your hands or your feet are turning blue, it's because your body has made the decision that you could live life without a hand, but you couldn't live life without your heart or your lungs. So it's going to keep those parts of you warm and sacrifice those parts of you that don't need to 
that you could live without if you had to. That, that is quite a statement because they look at me like with horror that I would even consider that they could live without a hand or a foot. But in fact, that's exactly what's happening. Um, that, that, you know, they're not getting the circulation there and unless we do something real quick to start that circulation going, and that has to do with eating, uh, to get enough fuel in their body, that I have seen individuals whose foot turned black, you know, so you really have to, really have to get serious about the effects. Decrease in bone development is really important too because we are starting to see younger people who, um, who have ha haven't, you know, if they're females, haven't had their menstrual periods for a very long time due to anorexia. Um, and so the estrogen hasn't been produced in their body for their bones to stay healthy. So one of the things that we really um, try to work quickly with children and adolescents is, is that we want to help them get their weight back to where it needs to be for their menstrual periods to occur um, so that we can get them to develop strong bones because they're, they're in a period of growth. There's something different with adults. You know, when you're dealing with adults, their bone growth is already completed. But with young people, you're still in the process of, of developing those strong bones. That's a reason why we try to work with them a little more assertively. Decrease in heart muscle is also something that can happen. Um, over time, if a person's body is getting thinner and thinner um, and all fat is being depleted, the body will actually turn to things like heart muscle to get what it needs. So you can see individuals with um, heart muscle being depleted as a result of uh, anorexia. An increase in stomach problems, and often you hear this from people who have bulimia, um, and sometimes it's the first reason that they've sought treatment as they've gone to their doctor and said, I'm really having problems with my stomach, it's achy or crampy, or, and really what's happened is that with binging and vomiting, their body doesn't know what's going on. Are you going to eat? Are you not going to eat? Are you going to eat too much? So what it ends up doing is that um, it kind of, when it gets the food from a binge, it, it might try to hold on to it longer, you know, and despite the fact that the person is vomiting, some of that food stays behind for sure uh, in, in the stomach. And the stomach kind of holds on to food a little longer if it's not sure that it's going to get food again for quite a while. So you start to get a really sluggish stomach going on. And uh, so a lot of problems can happen with stomachs. Okay, so now let's talk about recovery, because people do recover. The good news is that they, they can recover from an eating disorder, and about two-thirds of them do make a partial or full recovery. Um, what I'm going to show you here is uh, a, a sort of a metaphor that uh, we came up with in our clinic, along with uh, our readings that we had done on eating disorders. And also, this kind of mountain analogy came from listening to young people talk about their recovery. And, and I sort of like to interview people at the end of treatment. And sometimes I have an opportunity several years later to have them come back and tell their story. And uh, the kinds of things I hear from young people are things like, uh, well, you know, it took me a long time to overcome this eating disorder. Um, and I can't tell you at what point it changed, but you know, gradually what happened is I got to a point where um, I'd rather be without it than have it. You know, so I started to realize that I'd rather be going out with my friends and you know going out after a dance to a restaurant with them than to be sitting at home eating rice cakes or whatever. Um, so it kind of, they had to come to a point where they were ready and, and they fully then worked at getting better. But they were using words like, I had to overcome the most, you know, monumental thing in my life, which was this eating disorder. They started to get the idea that maybe it was like, you know, kind of climbing a mountain and thinking about having to overcome the mountain, getting to the top and seeing things from a different perspective. And so as a result of this, um, we put together this mountain, and it was Dr. Stephanie Casey's daughter who drew it for us, which was really nice. 
Um, and the other thing you see here is the one to six actually represents different stages along the mountain. And those stages represent um, what is called in the literature the stages of change that people go through when they make change. Um, so um, there are a couple of uh, big authors in this in this area. Dr. James Prochaska is one of them. And um, he's written a book uh, called uh, Changing Your Behavior for Good. It's a really nice, easy to read book. And it gives you the sense of what these stages are all about. Um, basically, when somebody is in pre-contemplation, which is at that stage one, the individual isn't even looking towards change. Um, they're basically saying, what eating disorder? I don't see an eating disorder. I, I don't have one. You may think I have one, but I don't. Or they may be saying, yeah, yeah, I have one, but I'm not looking at changing at all. This is fine with me. This is where I am. This is where I'm staying. Um, so here it's depicted as a young person looking over a cliff. And uh, the reason that we did this was because it nicely represented what was actually going on. Because if you don't know that an eating disorder is there, let's say you have anorexia and loss of weight you, you actually think is needed because you feel overweight. And so you think it's a good thing. And, um, and what happens is that you're looking away from the mountain. You don't even believe you have an eating disorder. And so you could easily fall off that cliff without even realizing that it's there. And so that's why we depicted it as a girl looking over that cliff. And as well, sometimes for, for some young people, that cliff represents the loss of weight and having to go into hospital. And they kind of see themselves as falling into the rocks at the bottom. And so in order to even get ready to start to recover, they have to get back up on the, on the cliff so that they can start walking towards the mountain. And that process, when you've fallen down to the rocks and have to get back up on the cliff, that may take, who knows, somewhere between three and six months just to get back on, you know, the bay, towards the base of the mountain. So that's not recovery yet. That's kind of getting your weight restored, and that's part of it. But that's still a long way from number six, which is being recovered from the eating disorder. So a lot of individuals, in fact, we've done a study to show that one-third of them when they come in to see us as children and adolescents, one third of them are right there at pre-contemplation. They don't even know they have a problem. So number two here, you can see a young person and they're looking both ways and they've got a big question mark above their heads. And that question mark represents, I don't know, yeah, some days I think I have an eating disorder, other days I don't. So some days I'm looking towards the mountain, other times I'm looking away. That might be within the course of an hour that that happens. This person's not ready to change yet. But they're thinking about it. They're thinking maybe, you know, maybe I was put in hospital for a, re a reason. Maybe they don't put people in hospitals that easily, you know. They, they wouldn't just do that because they're jealous or they're, maybe they did it for another reason. So they're beginning to contemplate. They're beginning to think there might be a problem. The Adolescent in number three here is packing her bags. This one knows I do have an eating disorder, and I've got to start to figure out how I'm going to climb this mountain, how I'm going to overcome it. So just as you'd pack your bag, your knapsack, to climb an actual mountain, this person is now starting to accumulate some of the tools that they're being educated with. Um, whether they be on the inpatient unit or the outpatient unit. Usually this is stuff that happens after they come out of hospital, if, if they had to be in hospital. So packing their bags. They might be learning, for example, how to um, eat without binging. They might be learning how to deal with after a binge, staying away from the bathroom for 15 minutes to kind of decrease the urge, things like that. Those are the tools. Or they might be, if they've been restricting, they might be learning how to eat three meals a day and three snacks. 
that sort of thing. So then the person in number four is taking action by, by stepping up, and there's a lot of rocks here. And the reason it's depicted that way is because none of this is easy, and actually as soon as they start taking action, it gets harder because they're actually trying to do things to change. And so some of them get scared and come back and say, this is too much, I'm not ready for this. And they, and they end up back in three where they're learning new tools before they start climbing again. Um, but it's important to realize that during that number four stage, they are experimenting a little bit with trying this and trying that. And sometimes parents get very frustrated because they see them go backwards and they're afraid that that means they're back at number one. I always try to caution people about that because I tell them you can never go back to number one. I don't mean that you can't go literally back. You can, for sure. But it's never the same. It's never the same the second time around. Because if you do go back to a one or two, you know what it takes this time to climb that mountain up to number four. The first time you didn't. You didn't know where the holes were. You didn't know where the ground was shaky and all of that. So you do know the second time. And young people will tell you that it isn't the same the second time around. Even if they needed to go in hospital a second time, it's not the same as the first. So it takes a long time to climb there, and then they get to a stage called maintenance. So they're still not at the top. It takes quite a while to just even maintain the changes that they've made. This isn't just a one way, as I said, you know, a clear, it would be nice if the path just went straight from point A to point B, but it doesn't. So you see a lot of cycling back and forth, and, and, and it takes a while before the person is actually up to that number five without falling backwards again. And it's during times of stress that are particularly difficult. So somebody who's been doing well for a while might, you know, graduate from high school and have a stressful period as they figure out what they're going to do with their life, you know. And so that might be a key time where, where they're having trouble with their eating again. It is a chronic problem for quite a while. Most of these individuals are in school, working, you know, leading productive lives, but it takes quite a while for them to get to the point where they are truly recovered, where they can say that they can be around lots of food and not binge on it. Um, or they can say that they can eat without having to think about fat grams and calories. So, you know, when I talk about being recovered, I mean being at a point where their bodies are, are more normal and they're acting more, um, you know, normally around food and their body and so on. So it takes a lot of time. Um, but I, I must say, too, that when we do see people recover, um, they are indistinguishable and from anyone else. And they will often say things like, you know, they'll come back and see us and we'll be the only ones who will know that there was ever a problem. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite remarkable to see somebody who was in hospital struggling for their life and then seeing them at a point where they're fully productive member of society and they're feeling good. Remember, too, that with an eating disorder, it's usually not just one thing um, that, that's, that's a problem. So that when, as I said, you know, 60% also have depression or strong anxiety. And, you know, there are other problems they could have as well, but they're lesser um, usually, like they could have a personality um, disorder as well. But if they have something like anxiety and depression, what happens is that as the eating disorder starts to get better, now they start feeling the real issues, which might be their, their mood problems or their anxiety around being around other people or whatever it is. So in other words, when I talk about Recovery Mountain, we're, we're talking about overcoming the eating disorder, but along the way, they're also having to deal with their depression. They're also having to deal with their anxiety and so on. So it's dealing with a lot of stuff. Um, during that course of time. So here's the difference here between adults and children. When we see children, 
We do not wait for children to get to the point where they're at number four to treat them, okay? When, when you're a treatment provider, you'd like to see everybody at number four because that's when they're truly ready to change and they're going to take action. Um, now, in the adult system, not everybody's at a four when they come into treatment, but to do the things they have to do to stay in treatment, they have to be pretty motivated. They have to fill out a lot of forms. They have to fill out diaries. They have to challenge themselves weekly. Okay, that's, that's um, an individual who's pretty motivated to do all of that stuff. So in the adult world, you need to be motivated enough to stay in treatment. With young people, we don't wait for them to be motivated. Um, why? Because they're at a point where um, their growth is really important. They're at a point where if we can catch them early, before this becomes a really entrenched behavior, they have a much better chance of a quicker recovery. So we'd be looking at that low end, maybe a three, three year, four year kind of thing rather than the upper end. So you know, you, you can get them earlier, you can treat them faster, um, and, uh, and the behaviors don't become as entrenched. So when you look at this with a child or an adolescent, you might imagine here, this is not drawn, but you might imagine a whole treatment team and parents working towards helping that young person, almost catching them with a net um, if, they're, if they're falling off the cliff, and also maybe giving them gentle pushes up the hill. Now, when they're doing that, uh, it's true that it is artificial in the sense that the young persons may not be there yet, may not be ready. To, to themselves make the changes. But what happens is that because young people are still under, uh, you know, living within a family and parents still have a fair bit of parental authority with them, um, the parents are able to, to give them that protective um, uh, um, push to help them to, to get to the point where they are more motivated. You see, the difficulty is, is that if you wait for a young person with anorexia to be motivated, as they lose weight, they become less motivated all along. Because as they lose weight, they, um, they also become more obsessive and more starved. And when the brain is starved, it doesn't make good decisions. So it's very hard to wait for them. It's, it's better to catch them and to get them into treatment so that we can start to learn how to help them to move forward. I've had a lot of young people say to me that once they've you know, recovered or at least gotten to the point of number four where they're taking action, they'll say, thank goodness you know, that my parents or someone very important to them noticed that I was having the problems I did because I would have gone right off the face of the earth without really realizing it. So, it's that serious that young people later will point out that they wouldn't have survived without the people who cared for them. Even though at the moment when you're talking to them or placing them into hospital, they may be as angry with you as they'll ever be in life. But remember that that's, that's part of the disorder, is that they're trying to defend this eating disorder, which for them is their survival at the moment. Uh, this was just one young girl. It kind of represented the way, you know, in the groups and so on that we do, how they motivate themselves. And this was, we, we let them do a lot of drawing. A lot of creative stuff is helpful for the individuals who have difficulty expressing their feelings. And this young girl was just, you know, she'd drawn her rainbow and put on it, I can do it, I will do it. And she put the reasons why she wanted to get better. And so if people think about those things, the reasons that they want to get better, that helps motivate them to move further. Okay, so how does this all work? Um, first of all, I just wanted to take you through some of the motivational stuff, and then we'll talk about the family work. So you would do this kind of thing if you were working with adults or children and teens. Um, one of the things we do in therapy is we have them write out what would be the pros of changing and what would be the cons of changing. So the pros of changing, meaning the pros of getting better, like starting to eat better or stopping the purging, that kind of thing. So this person wrote down, well, the pros for her would be getting out of hospital, graduating, no more people worried about me, being free and treated like a human being, being able to live 
And the cons were I'll get bigger, take up more space, gain weight, feel fat, greedy, and selfish. See how derogatory these words are. It will be the hardest thing I ever have to do. And so you can just see the struggle that this girl goes through. Now, um, which ones do you think were more important to her, the pros or the cons? Somebody had anorexia nervosa. The cons. Yeah, so even just in that number one, the getting bigger, some girls, that's all they write, getting fat. That's the only con they have. They may have a lot of pros of getting better, but if they put that one con of gaining weight, and then we ask them, well, how strong? It, how do you balance those out, which are stronger? They'll say the cons are stronger. Even though there's only one, it's stronger than all the reasons of that would be good to get better. So that's how weighty it is. Okay, so helping relationships then. How do parents help? Well, one of the things that we do is that um, when parents first come in and find out that their son or daughter has an eating disorder, it can be a very difficult first session because perhaps they may have thought about it themselves. They may not have been sure if, if maybe their son or daughter was suffering some other, from some other kind of stomach problem or, um, you know, they, they might be... Um, they might be surprised themselves because maybe it was only a day or two before that the child had been seen in a bathing suit and, and the parents' eyes kind of almost popped out of their heads because they hadn't seen them for quite a while without their, you know, without clothing all over them. And so they're seeing for the first time a really skeletal child and, and just had no idea this was going on. So there are lots of reasons why that first session is very difficult because people are coming to terms for the first time perhaps with how serious things have become. And, um, and it's at that point in time uh, that um, what, what we try to do is we help, try to help parents um, with the blame-guilt issue because I think it's, it's very easy in many ways to miss um, this particular diagnosis or, or this particular problem because we all, you know, we would want to believe that there is an explanation uh, that is simpler than an eating disorder. And so it's understandable that we might sort of hold out hope that it is something else and then miss the signs that are, that are there. Um, what we do with the parents in the first session is we let them know that, um, that in fact, you know, the research has shown, and in our clinical experience it has been true as well, that, that parents um, are in the really the best position to be able to help their son or daughter to get better. And so we don't want them to see themselves as, you know, to blame themselves for how the child got here, but at the same time we want to let them know that um, that we have found that the parents are actually the ones who can be the most help in helping their son or daughter get back on track. And sometimes parents will look at us with that statement and get very scared because they'll say, well, we have done, we've done everything we can uh, to help our son or daughter. We're hoping that you're going to take them and make the change. And in fact, we need to say to them that in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to help you. So it's going to be different this time because we are going to help you. But we know that because you are, you, you really are the ones who know the child the best and care for the child the most. And so one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to help you to help your child to get better. And uh, once the parents get the idea of how to do this, actually they can often um, feel much more empowered that they now know what to do. Because there's an awful lot of books out there and an awful lot of confusing information. And the treatment of children and adolescents is different than it is for adults. So if you're reading a book that is more adult-based, it's going to tell you perhaps that parents should butt out and that, you know, let the person wait till they're motivated and they will change and so on. Well, that may be so for an adult, but when it comes to children, not so. They're living within a family, and just as you would not let your child, 
you know, go out and walk across the street before they're ready to look both ways and make sure they're safe. With somebody with an eating disorder like anorexia, um, they have in their heads thoughts that tell them they're safe doing something when they're really not. So you really, as parents, it, it's important to sort of recognize that you're still in charge um, of, of helping your child in those areas. So that's, so how do we do this? So let's just look at an example. First of all, the family work, um, parents regain their authority to set limits regarding eating and activity. So that's what, um, what we do as, you know, as helpers, is we help the parents to regain that authority. And if, if the child has anorexia, then the child uh, regains a regular pattern of eating and activity and resumes growth and development. If there's binging and purging going on as well, that might also require some individual treatment and group treatment as well for the young person to learn how to, how to delay those things and, and, and to get control over them. Um, but if the child is young, especially anywhere, we, we might see kids anywhere from 11, 12, to uh, you know, right up to about 16 or so, this approach works very well. We find for the 17 and 18 year olds, although the research says that it does work well as, with that population, what we have found is if the young person is already kind of beyond parental authority in some ways, some of them as well have moved out or have, have you know, are not, it's not as close to their families, it's harder. But sometimes you see a 17 or 18 year old who's still quite young emotionally. And for those individuals, it, it can work really well, too. So with helping relationships, I just put one principle here to think about. Um, one of the biggest things we do is we help parents to think about their decisions, and we help them with problem solving so that they feel empowered to make good decisions themselves about what to do. So for example, we have them ask themselves the question, will my decision help my son or daughter in recovery, or will my decision enable the eating disorder? And this is a really tricky one because in a family, an eating disorder, we try to make it separate from the child just so we can talk about it and, and we can, um, we can uh, so that we can take the label away from the child as well. And they can also look at the eating disorder if we're talking about it as an, as an entity. Um, we, we tell the family, we know a lot about, for example, anorexia. As experts, we know about anorexia. It affects children and adolescents in the same way. No matter who you are, it has the same effect on you. It causes you to become very obsessive, it causes you to be counting calories or fat grams or measuring yourself in some way to make sure that you fit some kind of idea that you have is in your head that tells you that you're the right size and so on. So it affects people the same way. What does differ is the child or adolescent. They may have different characteristics and so on. But the thing that we're the expert on is the anorexia. Um, the parents are the experts on their child. So what we'll say to them is, okay, if the parents are asking a question like, um, you know, my, my son really wants a gym membership. He's got anorexia, and he really wants a gym mem membership, and he's told us that if we just give him this gym membership, then he'll be okay, and he's even promised he'll eat if we give him this gym membership. Um, so parents might ask a question like that. So I'm just going to put that out to the audience. What, what do you think? What, you know, would you have any questions about that? Or would you, what would, you, would be going through your mind if you were, quest, if you were asked that question as a, as a parent? Any ideas? Okay, there was a concern here that maybe the person might use the gym membership to, uh, to, in, you know, to, to do their eating disorder, which would be to increase their exercise and their drivenness and so on. 
Yeah, so that's a good question to have in your mind. Anything else at all? Okay, I think that's the main one. So now when you're sitting back and you're saying, well, will this decision help my son or daughter in recovery? Or will my decision enable the eating disorder? What do you think? Yes. So the individual said that it, it actually may enable the child to kind of do the eating disorder. And so it's very tough because you may have your son or daughter saying, but please, and there might be tears in their eyes, and they might, they might say to you, but it would reduce my stress, and then I'd be able to eat. The thing is, if an individual is already starving, the last thing you want to do is increase their activity. You want to keep them calm. You want to make sure that they get their weight back to where it needs to be for them to be active. So we, we help parents to kind of problem solve these types of issues. And as the parents become more solid and um, educated about the eating disorder, um, we have full faith that they will be able to make the decisions. Um, they won't need to be asking the treatment team every time because they become more solid in understanding what's actually helping their son or daughter in recovery and what is enabling the eating disorder. And oftentimes they've been enabling the eating disorder for very good reasons. I mean, in the sense that they were afraid that their son or daughter was just going to get too upset or couldn't handle their stress, and so they kind of just kept giving in to the eating disorder. And you know, as a result of that, it gets stronger. So one of the things that parents need to do with this when their child has this disorder is that they need to relearn how to stand up to the eating disorder in order to be able to set limits on it. And that allows their son or daughter to actually be able to also resist the eating disorder. When the parents don't do that, if the parents can't resist the eating disorder, the child or adolescent won't be able to. So it's, it's a very tricky thing, but it's something that once parents do get empowered with, they begin to understand how that works and why it's so important. And it's all based really on common sense, but what happens is the eating disorder brings you into a whole different, whole different ball game. It kind of is so sneaky that you start believing that maybe you know, maybe this is what I need to do uh, to make the person feel better. And in fact, it may be the exact opposite that you need to do. You may need to set limits on that eating disorder. And, uh, and at the same time, let your son or daughter know that, you know, um, we know this isn't easy for you. And we know it's hard for you not to have that gym membership. But this is what we're deciding and why. And it's best if, if mom and dad are solidly on the same page and that the treatment team as well, that you're all on the same page working with the same set of assumptions and treatment and so on. And then it helps young people then to move their motivation forward because they say, I guess if everybody is feeling the same way, well, maybe there is something wrong here with me. It takes a while, but it's very hard when every expert and parent that you come into contact with is telling you the same thing to to then deny that you need to do that. Okay, I think, yeah, we're at the very end. Now I'm just going to show you. There's one book I would highly recommend, and it's on your references. It's called Helping Your Teenager Beat an Eating Disorder. This is the book, Guilford Press. And um, we find that it's it's really one of the best books out there, and it's because it's geared to, to really working with children and teens, and it is the Monsley approach. So you're getting it right from the authors as to what they would kind of, how they work with parents and what they would advise them. All right, I'm going to entertain questions now.